Facebook shapes our perception of the world by choosing the information we see. Even those who don't use Facebook are impacted by the majority who do. A company with such frightening influence over so many people, over their deepest thoughts, feelings, and behavior, needs real oversight. But Facebook's closed design means it has no real oversight. Only Facebook knows how it personalizes your feed for you. As long as Facebook is operating in the shadows, hiding its research from public scrutiny, it is unaccountable. Until the incentives change, Facebook will not change. Left alone, Facebook will continue to make choices that go against the common good, our common good. Hi, everyone. It's 5 o'clock in the East. I'm Jason Johnson in for Nicole Wallace. It's been a busy 72 hours for Facebook, a whistleblower who exposed the company's knowledge and suppression of data about the harmful effects of its products, revealed herself on Sunday night. Yesterday, the company's family of apps, including Instagram and WhatsApp, were down for over five hours. Wasn't it peaceful? And today, that same whistleblower, Francis Haugen, appeared before the Senate, pleading with lawmakers to hold the social media company accountable for, as she said, bluntly, putting its astronomical profits before people. Haugen addressed how the social media company knows its products hurt children and stoke divisions in this country, saying it weakens our democracy and has a negative effect on children and teens' mental health. Yet... She explained the company repeatedly ignores these findings from its own researchers. Here, Haugen explains the danger of Facebook's algorithms. The dangers of engagement-based ranking are that Facebook knows that content that elicits an extreme reaction from you is more likely to get a click, a comment, or reshare. Facebook's own research says they cannot adequately identify dangerous content. And as a result, those dangerous algorithms that they admit are picking up the, 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 the extreme sentiments, the division, they can't protect us from the harms that they know exist in their own system. It is causing um, teenagers to be exposed to more anorexia content. It is pulling families apart. And in places like Ethiopia, it's literally fanning ethnic violence. Facebook released a statement after her testimony saying, quote, today a Senate subcommittee, a Senate committee, Senate subcommittee held a hearing with a former product manager of Facebook who worked for the company for less than two years, had no direct reports, never attended a decision point meeting with C-level executives and testified more than six times to not working on the subject matter in question. We don't agree with her characterization of the many issues she testified about. Despite all this, we agree on one thing. It's time to begin to create standard rules for the Internet. It's time for Congress to act. A sentiment we heard from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle during the hearing today, acknowledging the need for a reckoning around the regulation of Facebook and other tech companies. And big tech now faces that big tobacco, jaw-dropping moment of truth. It is documented proof that Facebook knows its products can be addictive and toxic, to children. And it's not just that they made money again, it's that they valued their profit more than the pain that they cause to children and their families. The damage to self-interest and self-worth inflicted by Facebook today will haunt a generation. Feelings of inadequacy and insecurity, rejection, and self-hatred will impact this generation for years to come. Clicking on like on Facebook's harmful practices is where we start this hour. Joining us now, Kara Swisher, host of the Pivot podcast and a New York Times contributor, plus Clinton Watts, former consultant to the FBI counterterrorism division, and now a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, plus MSNBC political analyst, former Congresswoman Donna Edwards is here. Thank you so much. Um, Kara, I'll start with you. We had testimony today. Uh, Ms. Haugen came forward and said, look, this company is doing bad things. We need to do something about it. What were your impressions from just today's testimony? Is this going to be uh, the moment where the dam breaks and Congress actually does something, or is it going to be a bunch of chest beating and performance? Well, it is in Congress's hands now. They have documents. They have testimony. I thought she was incredibly articulate. I thought she explained very difficult issues very well, and she brought documents. I think this is a lot of stuff we've all been writing about and saying for many years now, and Congress has sat there on its hands. 
Now she's right in front of them, showing them and walking them through it. And I thought it was very effective. I think if they don't act, it's all it's not Facebook's fault anymore. It's Congress's fault. Um, what I thought was interesting was Facebook trying to impugn her by calling her a nobody. I think that's what they were doing. Um, but you don't have to run the sausage factory to understand when the sausage is rotten. And that, to me, was really appalling by them, but typical of Facebook, which is to shoot the messenger. Uh, Donna, one of the things that's always concerned me, whether it's Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or anything else like that, is that there is a gap between the expertise and senators and members of Congress and what technology is, right? And I'm not suggesting that they're all completely out of date, but you know, do you think that there are enough members of Congress who are knowledgeable enough about social media, about Facebook and Instagram, that they can actually construct functional policy to regulate these kind of entities? I think, um, you know, I was thinking the same thing when I listened to Ms. Hogan's testimony, and I thought one of the most compelling things about her testimony is, frankly, that it was in plain English. And there was an ability for lawmakers both to ask questions and for her to respond in ways that not only members of Congress, but the American public can understand. I come out of technology, and so um, it was always complicated to be in a Congress where uh, so many members don't have a technological background. It's tough to kind of grapple with some of these issues. But look, it's Congress. They have the ability to get the kind of expertise that they need um, to be able to regulate these platforms in a way that will create more good and less less harm. And I think that was the important value of the testimony today. And I agree with Kara. It really is now in Congress's hand. There is no absence of information or data that can stand in their way. And this really has to be done because it will be in the public interest. Clint, speaking of public interest, one of the most important things, and again, you know this, I know this, everyone's been paying attention to this for the last several years, that Facebook basically seems to profit the most when they are promoting or advancing or turning a blind eye towards the most provocative and incendiary elements of their website. The websites that are screaming at you that, 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 that the world is being taken over by a terrible cabal of people in New York City and, and Muslims are invading from the South and black people and Black Lives Matter are going to take your free cell phones. That's the kind of stuff they seem to make the most money from. That's the kind of stuff they seem to get the most engagement with. What actually is the day-to-day -day security impact of having so many people linked into a website that profits off of basically pain and anguish? Jason, I think we've seen it, which is, it starts with anger, uh, a little bit of emotion. Then it comes to people linking up in the real world with their emotions and their anger to January 6th, where they mobilize and undermine things like democracy or commit extremist acts. You know, we've had terrorism now for about 15 years in different forms on social media and the internet. And that's one of the problems that I also see for Congress that they don't really address. Many of the actions that they talk about, either breaking up big tech or trying to reform it, ultimately lead to the problem that the profit incentive and motive is directly tied to human psychology. The system is designed, it is called a like button. It is designed to give you more of what you like from people that look like you and talk like you and share your opinions and what you want the world to be. That's gonna be almost impossible to engineer out without making a massive cut in profits. It cuts down on engagement. No one wants to go to a really boring social media app to hear things that are really boring from people that are very boring. So there is a fundamental problem, I think, for the social media companies, which is, how do they get back to what I call cats and kids, right? That's the two things they kind of cherished in the beginning and get away from things like extremism, war, social conflict, and politics. And the last part I would say, Jason, is, look, some of the worst offenders are on Capitol Hill. They're the ones that use Facebook to target their voters. So this is going to be an enduring problem and why I've testified, I think, four times uh, regarding social media in different facets, and, and not one rule has ever come from any of those things. I'm glad that you said that, Clint, because, again, I, I think the election impact is the biggest thing. Facebook in and of itself can't do anything, but Facebook can facilitate people who want to do harm getting together. I want to play this sound uh, from, from, uh, from Ms. Haugen, and I want to get Kara's thoughts on what the impacts are and what Facebook has been doing when it comes to American elections. Facebook has been emphasizing a false choice 
They've said uh, the safeguards that were in place before the election impl uh, implicated free speech. The choices that were happening on the platform were really about how reactive and twitchy was the platform, right? Like how viral was the platform? And Facebook changed those safety defaults in the run up to the election because they knew they were dangerous. And because they wanted that growth back, they wanted the acceleration of the platform back after the election, they, re they returned to their original defaults. And the fact that they had to, th to break the glass on January 6th and turn them back on, I think that's deeply problematic. Kara, so when we hear that, we're, we're basically hearing Facebook was like, all right, yeah, yeah, rah, 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 okay, okay we'll be quiet now. Somebody's paying attention. And yeah. then the moment the election yeah. is over, they're right back to it. What, what do we do about that? Well, you know, they don't, they don't have, they don't want to make money from hate. Let's just say, let me be clear, Facebook didn't invent hate. And that's a point they make, which I think they're correct about. What they've done, though, is amplify and weaponize it. And that's something that's never happened before. You can't have enough billboards to do this. You know, as much as Fox News or other organizations contribute to misinformation, it's not this big. And that's the problem. It's big, it's global, it's uncontrollable. And then the people who run the company are unaccountable. And by the way, they can't be fired, Mark Zuckerberg in particular. He's the one that actually can't be fired. So what she was saying here was that they want to, the, the, the focus of Facebook since its start has been on growth, 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 and ex, an obsession with growth. And so anything that gets in its way, they find to be a problem. And when you build an architecture for virality rather than context, for speed rather than accuracy, you're going to run into, it's very easy. You don't have to be a computer scientist to understand that human hate can be um, made into a twitchy, angry organism rather quickly. By the way, you can do the opposite and make a lot of money. Look at Snapchat, look at TikTok, which also have some problems, by the way, but not nearly in the amount that Facebook does. Right. For, for every sort of angry, screaming television show out there. There's a Ted Lasso, right? There could be a clean, yeah. nice version of Facebook if we wanted it. Um, Donna, so my question about this, because I think there's also a technical issue that Kara sort of alludes to. When people talk about, hey, 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 we need to break up Facebook, it's not a phone company. There, there's, you could turn Facebook into five different entities, and it's very possible they would do the same thing. What kind of policy could Congress actually pass to reel this in other than essentially turning Facebook into a newspaper where they'd have to start editing their content, which would almost defeat the purpose of the site? Well, I think you've hit on it. Um, if you break it up into pieces and the pieces still are uh, enabled to act in the same way, that does not change the environment. And I think one of the things that we know is that Facebook, as has been described, is able to manipulate its algorithms when it wants. And so then the question becomes, why, why are we enabling those algorithms to be used and to be created and manipulated in a way that manipulates the public? And so those are questions I think that Congress can begin to address and to put some, uh, begin to put some limits on. But this is also about the responsibility of Facebook and its executives and accountability. And as they've been increasingly scrutinized, they've gone from the, you know, sort of, I don't want to, uh, I'll apologize for this, to being defensive about their platform instead of creating ways in which to have a conversation about how the act can be, can be cleaned up. Clint, yesterday, uh, I don't know if you recognize this. I did. There was five hours of relative peace. Facebook and Instagram were down. People were talking to each other. Kids were dancing in the streets in the middle of COVID. We, we had a shutdown on Facebook. But I think for a lot of people, it was also this realization of how influential this website has become. And you've got some people uh, from an economic standpoint who are like, hey, look, my business requires that I'm on Facebook. You have some national security people who are saying, look, this place is, you know, Facebook makes $54 billion a year. They influence elections. They're essentially a hostile power. How do we frame Facebook now? It's not a newspaper. It, it, I think it's unrealistic to say it's a hostile power. It's not a terrorist. It's not Hydra. It's not Cobra. How do we even frame this so that we can start addressing it from a national security and a domestic security standpoint? Yeah, Jason, I, I think you're right. You know, uh, the outage essentially plunged America into productivity yesterday instead of distraction, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, look, in certain countries, Facebook is almost a utility. I, I think India is a great example of this. Many of the company, uh, countries around the world, I'll never forget the first time I was in Africa uh, talking to somebody, let's, let's look something up on the internet. And you said, 
they said to me, you mean I'm going to Facebook it? I mean, that is, that is their concept of the internet is Facebook. And it does provide essential services, uh, linkages uh, around the world. And remember, it was not that long ago that we were celebrating Facebook and Twitter for the Arab Spring. I mean, we saw it spray painted on the walls in Cairo. So, you know, from this broader perspective, there are lots of great and amazing things that have happened in the developing world in terms of communications and commerce. So we can't always just say, hey, we don't like what our politician is saying on there on January 6th. There's a lot of other things going on around the world. But that comes to the point of, hey, we are a, essentially a country that has a utility provider for the world that resides inside the United States that is basically unregulated and hardly regulated in most of the developing world. And, and that was the comment about Ethiopia you heard during our testimony there. In some of these countries, uh, Myanmar, Ethiopia, it incites violence. In other countries, it's the backbone almost to the civilization and how it works. So we really need to think very, very broadly about what policies we implement. And oh, by the way, what doesn't come up in any of these conversations is China is sitting there ready in the void, maneuvering, accelerating both their infrastructure, their applications, and their use of artificial intel intelligence, and they have no boundaries and no barriers on it. So it, it is a global sort of discussion that we need to have and think about, and it's one that is not going to be solved in just a couple committee sessions. I think that's two parts to it. One, the biggest offenders are also on Capitol Hill, but the, the problem goes well beyond Capitol Hill and all the way around the world as well. Once we start adding more and more AI to things like social media, we are five steps away from Skynet. Kara, I want to make sure we get to this because I think it's important. A lot of people need to understand Facebook also owns Instagram, and there's been a lot of discussion about how Instagram has affected young people, affected self-esteem. I want to point out from a, from a demographic standpoint, uh, my college students at Morgan State University, they're not on Facebook. Facebook is for old people yeah. as far as they're concerned. Yep. They're mostly on Instagram. Instagram can be just as poisonous when it comes to self-esteem and politics. What's something that we might be able to do about that site, which is primarily about images and people performing lives that we know they're not really living? Well, it's just it's continued regulation and transparency on what's happening there. So people could just like you put uh, warnings on cigarettes. There could be warnings. There could be lots of things that they could do. Um, and so I think what's really important is that Facebook become more transparent as much as they hate it. Uh, they're going to have to do that because now employees are going to be throwing documents over the wall and it's not going to look good. And so the best thing they can do is really work together and recognize they have a problem and that they're, they're critically important and that they have no accountability. Now they can say we call for regulation, but none of it matters if the CEO can never be fired. I mean, think about that. Like someone who, who runs the biggest communications medium in the history of the world cannot be fired. And to the utility thing that you were just talking about, when I first met Mark Zuckerberg and we went on a walk, he compared Facebook to a utility. He said, I want it to be a utility. At the time, there was a very much sexier MySpace going on, which of course died. Um, but he really wanted to think of that company like that. Well, if he's a utility, utilities are regulated. And when they screw up, things happen to them. And that's that's how I kind of look at it. If we think of Facebook as a utility, because you cannot put it in any bucket, really. And by the right. way, they do edit. They do communicate. They do do uh, content. They do a lot of things. Um, if you think of it as a utility, you can start to really think about how you want to regulate this medium. I love the idea of, of putting warning labels onto Instagram. This drip is not real. This lifestyle isn't how they're living. Kara Swisher, thank you for spending some time with us. Clint Watts and Donna Edwards are sticking with us.